so that we can get started with today's activity. Science, Technology, and Energy for Tuesday, the 20th of February, 2024. As is our custom, we'll begin our activity this morning by all rising and joining Representative Corman as he leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, so we're here this morning to conduct a full committee work session on three bills. Those same three bills will be the subject of an executive session starting at one o'clock this afternoon. Those three bills are House Bill 1600FN relative to participation in net energy metering, House Bill 1623FN relative to state energy policy, and HB 1036 relative to assessment of cost effectiveness of the system's benefit charge. Before we move along to our work session this morning, we have a couple of administrative duties to take care of. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to Representative Bernardi to talk about two things. One is the ISO New England trip, which is planned for March 15th, I believe. And then um, also to have a discussion about topics that might be of interest to, to the committee for presentations by either the DOE or the DES or D, New Hampshire DES or any other entity that we might like to hear from. So, Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, as you have noted, uh, the first item is our ISO New England trip, which is the 15th of March. That is now confirmed. Uh, and leaving here at 8 o'clock. Um, I have asked that anybody who has particular issues they would like the uh, commission to advise us on, uh, please send me those. I have received a few, but uh, if anybody else wants to do that, please uh, get them to me as soon as possible because I am going to be corresponding with ISO New England to set up an agenda so that we can make sure we go through the, the topics that you're concerned with. And also, as mentioned, uh, we're looking for at least a presentation by both DOE and DES. Uh, I sent out a note uh, to folks requesting that they send, again, comments or area issues or questions they want addressed. Um, I've received a few. I would like to receive more. Anybody interested, please forward those to me. So. I can get them to the respective agencies so they can uh, plan their presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd like to add, um, with the Chair's concurrence, and I know this question will come up, when we travel on these trips, we are representing the state of New Hampshire. And so I would um, suggest that we, we dress appropriately. Sometimes people do have questions on what they should be wearing, but for me, I'll be wearing my coat and tie. So if, they, if you have anything to say, Chair, Mr. Chair. I agree that decorum would uh, suggest that we should all dress, dress the same way that we would dress for a committee meeting or a House session, since that is the standard dress code of the House, business casual. Okay. Before we start our work session, I have one other issue to, to discuss with the committee. At our committee meeting last Tuesday in an exec session, we unanimously passed an amendment to House Bill 1644. And it has been brought to my attention that there is a question concerning the germaneness of the amendment that we adopted, even though we adopted it unanimously. There was no question of germaneness at the time of the adoption. So I went to the clerk this morning, had an extensive discussion with him. He is going to take the substance of my discussion to the speaker 
The two of them are going to talk about whether or not they believe this bill is germane, and they will respond back to us at some point during the day today with a decision about whether that bill is germane or not. And as soon as I hear from the clerk, I will pass that information, information along to the rest of you. Representative Bernardi. I'm horrible with numbers. Can you tell me what the topic of the bill was? Yes, 1644 was the bill to which we amend, that we amended to add nuclear to class one uh, recs in the renewable portfolio standard. Thank you. And that's adding nuclear after the date, built after the date, 20, let's see, September 1st, 2024. Okay. With that out of the way, we can now begin our full committee work session. We're going to go slightly out of order because as we've all discovered during this session year so far, OLS sometimes delivers stuff on time and sometimes doesn't. And so we don't have the amendment for House Bill 1036 yet. Representative Harrington was at OLS this morning. Representative Harrington, you want to tell us what they told you? Uh, well, I had requested the uh, amendment by 214, and I didn't receive anything over the weekend. So I went down there this morning, and they basically said it hadn't been done yet, and they were going to work on it right away and try to get it up to uh, the fourth floor in this building as soon as possible. Okay. So we do not have the finished amendment for 1036 as of this moment. So we're going to start our work session by discussion, discussing House Bill 1600 FN relative to participation in net energy metering. And we do have an amendment for that, which was filed by Representative Corman and myself. It's amendment number 2024-0740H. And I'm going to turn it over to Representative Corman to discuss what the amendment does and to also discuss that there may be a subsequent amendment coming that makes a small change. Representative Corman. Thank, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And actually, I have now a digital copy of the further amendment, which will be 0764H. And the only difference in the new amendment is the effective date. So if you look at 0740H, it says the uh, effective date is 60 days after passage. The original bill was supposed to take effect immediately upon passage. That's what the new amendment does. Excuse so if me, you Mr. have O seven four O. I'm waiting for for hard copies okay. of the new new version. Um, and Chair Bowes sent out copies of O seven four O. Is that right? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, so I can I can walk you through this. The original bill, if you recall, had two sections. And the first section said that a municipal host that is used to offset the load of municipal or county aggregations pursuant to RSA 53E, that's the net metering statute, shall be a customer of a municipal or county aggregation and not on utility default service with compensation for their output made pursuant to RSA 362A9, paragraph 2. And the idea of this is that when a municipal host is um, actually serving a municipal or county aggregation. It's not going to be on default service, and therefore it's, it's reducing the load that needs to be served by ISO. So we're actually, this is load reducing. That's, that's the beauty of it. The amendment, uh, 0740 and its friend 0764, the same wording is there, but it's moved to a different section of the RSAs. So in the original bill, this wording is in RSA 362A, but it's really about community power, and so the amendment moves it to 53A as a new paragraph uh, 4A. So that's, that's the first change. Any questions? I'm sorry? Oh, did I, say, I said 53A? Yeah. 53E, eh? So, so any questions? We're Canadian, eh? <laughs> and, any questions on that? 
And just a reminder, this is uh, actually presented to us originally by Cliff Below, who is the chair of the Community Power Coalition. Yes, and uh, Mr. Below approves of this change. So would it be safe to say that the essence of this change is to move this language out of the d statute that defines municipal host and puts it into the statute about community aggregation? That would be a very good way to say it, yes. Okay, thank you. Is there one other change that the amendment makes? Yes, there is. Uh, so in the original bill, um, there was a section two about uh, retiring uh, generators from the ISO New England market. That is gone. And there's a new section two that really is just housekeeping. Um, it changes RSA 53E4 paragraph six, where it refers to RSA 53E7 paragraph two. That's actually the wrong paragraph. It should be paragraph three. And that's that change. And this is about uh, customer data. And if you were to look at 53E7, paragraph two, it's nothing about customer data. Uh, paragraph three is about customer data. So it's, it's really just housekeeping. Okay, discussion of the amendment. So it's a, it's a pretty straightforward amendment. I think it substantially improves the bill because the previous version of the bill, which puts this language into the definition of municipal host, substantially muddied the waters for the application of that statute and would have required um, some administrative uh, changes in order to effectively apply the new language. But by moving it to this statute, it makes it easy, easier to apply it and doesn't affect non-aggregation municipal host facilities. So I think it's a vastly superior bill and I think it warrants support by the full committee. Further discussion, Representative Munns. Um, I have a, a question for Representative Corman. Does this address the, the issue that uh, folks like yourself who are in a community aggregated power arrangement and have solar panels, are having with you know getting credit for that? It certainly doesn't solve the problem. I think it takes a baby step toward it by at least getting the uh, data part in the right place, but it's it, it alone is not solving the problem. Representative uh, Munz, you have a follow-up? Quick one. So it really is addressing just those municipal um, Power producers. Yeah, that's really Municipal. the thrust of the bill. So it's not addressing the individual um, uh, individuals like yourself. No. Okay. Thank you, Representative Harrington. Just a quick comment. I think anything we can do to make uh, uh, aggregation and community power less confusing than it is, because I mean, I get a lot of phone calls and emails, and people are just totally lost. Is a step in the right direction. So I think it's a good idea. Additional discussion. Well, seeing none, I think we should be fairly happy with this uh, amendment to House Bill 1600. When we get the new version, 0764H, we will pass that out to everyone. And that's the bill we will, or that's the amendment we will take up in our exec session. I, I have one other comment, which is um, I'm yes. hoping that this will maybe go on consent or at least... Uh, have have no need for a floor speech because this is the sort of thing that uh, floor speech would be no fun for anyone. I agree with that. We'll try to make that happen. All right, any further discussion? Okay, let's move on then. I was just handed moments ago by our <clears throat> extremely competent committee researcher a amendment to House Bill 1036. It is amendment number 0763H. And I will pass out copies now to everyone. Yep. So this amendment was filed by Representative Harrington 
and I am a co-sponsor of this amendment. We worked with uh, numerous parties to come up with what we thought would be acceptable language to solve a problem that we believe is one of significant importance to energy efficiency policy. So this, the original language that was passed in House Bill 549 to essentially rescue the energy efficiency program that was in jeopardy of being scrapped is the section of law under 374F3, paragraph 4AD4, that talks about cost effectiveness. And that's the section of law that's being, um, that this proposed amendment is looking at. So what this amendment wants to do is it want to, wants to give the Public Utilities Commission more flexibility to determine if cost effectiveness tests are appropriate to the time in which they're being applied and are the fairest tests that can be uncovered and used to determine the cost effectiveness of energy efficiency programs. Now, In current statute, there are a couple of tests that are used to see if um, energy efficiency programs are cost effective. One is called the Granite State Test, the other is called the Total Resource Cost Test. And this amendment states that those tests will still be used when the Commission tries to determine whether energy efficiency programs are cost effective or not. However, the amendment goes on to say that the commission may consider modifications to the tests and different or additional tests, as long as they're developed through an adjudicative process and approved by, prior, by order prior to the commencement of a triennium period, if a superior test should emerge. Now, it doesn't require the commission to adopt a different test. It just says that the commission may consider a different test. Well, why would it be important for the commission to be able to do that? The Granite State test was developed through an adjudicative process as a pretty sturdy and hardy test that a lot of folks think works very, very well. And that's why the statute doesn't require that it be abandoned or modified in any way. And that's important because in a letter that the consumer advocate wrote to this committee as his written testimony with regard to this, the original version of this bill, he stated and I quote, if you like ratepayer energy efficiency, you favor a low discount rate, which is one of the inputs to the Granite State test. And if you think ratepayer energy, ratepayer funded energy efficiency is bad public policy, you prefer a high discount rate. Well, what that quote says to me is that the Granite State test is manipulable, depending on how you manipulate the inputs. Now, do we want to put into public policy a tool that allows people to manipulate the outcome of something as important as a cost-benefit test? I would argue that we do not. What we want to put into statute is a process that the commission can use to determine cost effectiveness in as 
objective and neutral a manner as is possible. Not via some test that could be manipulable, manipulable based on how you configure the inputs to the test. Now, I know that some people are kind of in a mord of regulators as experts and the only people who should have the authority and the responsibility for determining what's important in terms of regulation. But I believe that policymakers need to set out the parameters of what regulators should do. I was particularly struck recently by a quote by an administrative law judge, Naomi Rao, a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia Circuit, who previously served as the administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs and as a law professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. She said recently, and this is a really salient quote, and I will quote her directly, executive branch agencies lack this type of representation. She was referring to the kind of representation that you get in Congress. Agencies are staffed by subject matter, quote, unquote, experts and bureaucrats drawn from a narrow knowledge class. Siloed in their areas of expertise, agency staff often act as policy partisans. They simply do not represent the diversity of interests across American society. And they are institutionally not well suited to recognize the broader economic and social trade-offs of regulatory policy. I believe she's right. Therefore, it's up to us as policymakers to produce a framework for implementing regulation that is as objective and neutral as possible. And that's why I think this amendment is absolutely necessary to give the Public Utilities Commission the framework in which to move forward with its deliberations in a neutral manner to test the cost effectiveness of energy efficiency programs. So I'm in favor of this men amendment, as you can no doubt uh, guess, <clears throat> and uh, I'll look forward to hearing comments from the rest of the committee about the amendment. Representative McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I absolutely agree with the intention of, um, of the amendment. And I think that the idea that we should be looking out for the ratepayers' money and making sure that our programs are cost effective um, is, is an important goal. And also to establish objective criteria in the meeting of that goal, again, we are in agreement. What I did in preparation for review of this amendment is I went back and read the order 26908 that was referred to in our hearing on this bill by DOE. And it's about a 27 page amendment. It's on the last triennial plan. It has a, um, a dissenting opinion at the end of it. And it has, um, it has a lot of uh, language in it about concern for various types of financial instruments that could be used, um, various ways that we could carve up the people who are the beneficiaries of energy efficiency. Um, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in that order. Um, but, but what it seems to be is, um, is a bit, uh, subjective rather than objective in terms of the, what the order was intended to do, which was advance the, the plan that was being put in front of the Public Utilities Commission. Um, so 
I looked back at HB 549, the language there, the intent there, um, and it was very specific in terms of asking the Public Utilities Commission to not be overturning the will of the legislature that had been provided uh, on making uh, the joint utilities provide these types of programs uh, through the system benefit charge. So the last place that I landed in trying to just provide context around whether this change is a good change was I went back to look at 374F colon three. And what I realized was that the cost effectiveness section um, mentions evaluation, measurement, and valuation studies. But if you go to section five, it says, the joint utilities shall present a joint energy efficiency plan to the commission for review and ap approval no less frequently than every three years. And then it goes on to say up to 5% of the overall program budget shall be expended on evaluation, measurement, and verification studies, which the department or joint utilities shall contract for as the department deems necessary to assure program funds are optimized to deliver rate payer savings and to secure funds available from wholesale energy and ancillary services markets. So the mechanism for the review has been left also with the Department of Energy and with the joint utilities to provide that data to the commission. So when the plans are presented, the cost effectiveness and the measures that are being used are presented as well. And what I see in this amendment is that we are opening the door to try and muddy the waters, to use the term you used earlier, um, in order to bring in perhaps uh, subjective tests that do not belong in this proceeding because right now, and I did speak with uh, one of the joint utilities about this as well, and the feedback that I got was that from the utilities perspective, they want surety. They want to understand how the program is supposed to proceed, what hurdles they have to meet, and what information they have to provide. And when the goalposts keep being moved by people who can come up with other financial tests to throw into the mix, it doesn't really benefit anyone. It just creates instability in a program that when we passed HB 549, we said we wanted to be set so that it would not cause the kind of chaos that it did uh, for the utilities and also for the weatherization businesses in New Hampshire um, when the uncertainty is put into, into the system. So I think if we don't have an alternative to provide, that we should not open the Pandora's box of saying, yeah, if you can think of something else, you can use that or you can bring it up and ask people to think about that. I think if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I think this is a really good example of that. And um, and I, I think if folks want to read the dissenting opinion on Order 26908, uh, that pretty much mirrors my opinion, is that the, I would hope that the Public Utilities Commission as regulators would try and maintain some consistency for the policies that the legislature has provided. And... and uh, that this kind of a fly in the ointment, which is how I see it, would not be entered into lightly, uh, since there's been so much uh, effort put into trying to create a process that everybody understands. So that's that's what I got. <laughs> okay, thank you. I want to... Excuse me. I would argue that... Um, having read 26,908 myself, that the two or three, two out of the three commissioners did identify what they thought was something that was broken that needed to be fixed. Any further discussion? Representative Munns, Representative Harrington, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess I'm a little befuddled by some of the discussion here because it sounds as if we have some obligation to the utilities and the weatherization companies to provide them a nice even plan that they don't have to worry about when they're getting subsidized by ratepayer money. 
Let's not forget, all this money comes from the rate payers. They pay it whether they want to or not, whether they can take advantage of it or not. Maybe they're living in an apartment and they can't, they can't enjoy the joys of energy efficiency or weatherization because it just isn't practical. But they pay for it anyways. The weatherization companies and utilities ought to be lucky that they're getting this. They both make money off of this program. And all this simply does is say, we're going to give you surety through 2026. So for the next couple of years, three years, you can turn around and you don't have to make any changes. And if it's determined by the PUC in the future that maybe there's a more a more effective way or more accurate way of measuring any of the energy efficiency programs uh, to put them up against whatever new information may be available, that the PUC can consider this. But if they're going to do it, they have to go through a full adjudicative process and announce those changes 12 months before they come into effect, which gives more than enough time for the weatherization companies and the utilities to make modifications to their program. Again, the ratepayers are under no obligation to make life easy as possible for those two groups. The thing that should be counting here is what is the most effective and accurate way of measuring energy efficiency and that we want to give them the flexibility, if there is a more accurate way, to do that. And this would only be done for the full adjudicative process where all these various players and actors could come in and have their day in front of the PUC and state why they should change or why they shouldn't. But I just think giving them flexibility is just common sense. Representative Munns. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I am befuddled as well. Um, on, on the one hand, I am hearing that um, we should leave it to the legislature to set policy and um, I believe this legislature did that when they passed HB 549 and expressed the, um, the will of the legislature that the particular tests that are currently in statute should be used. Um, yet I'm hearing um, that we want to pass this amendment to give the executive branch flexibility. Um, which, you know, goes counter to the argument that the legislature should be the one setting policy. So it, it seems like we want to have both sides, and I'm, uh, I'm confused. I'd like to clear up your confusion. <clears throat> All this legislation says is that the people who are responsible for determining whether cost-effectiveness, the cost-effectiveness sta um, standard is met, need to have the flexibility to consider all the possible tests that could be used to find one that's the most accurate. Now, it may be the ones that have already been identified, but should we preclude them from looking at others? That's all the amendment says. Representative Munns? Yet in the quote that you read, you, you, you highlighted the fact that we should not... Um, trust subject matter experts in the executive branch to make those decisions. No, that's not what the quote said. The quote said that those subject matter experts are no different from the rest of us. And they can occasionally be partisan. But if you set up policy in such a way to be as objective as possible, you can ameliorate the partisan differences that we all have. We live in a pluralistic society. We have to accommodate the differing views of everyone to the degree that we can. And the way we do that is by setting up good, sound policy that eliminates as much as possible the objectiveness of partisanship, subjectiveness of a partisanship. Representative Munns. But, but isn't that what happened when HB 549 was passed? The executive branch, the PUC, took an action that the legislature disagreed with. So the legislature, exercising its legislative power and duty, decided that that was not the direction that the legislature wanted the executive branch to go. And therefore, they, they passed HB 549, which specified what the test should be, overriding the PUC. I don't think they overrode the PUC with regard to the tests. The tests were already being used. 
what HB 549 did was restore the entire program. And what this bill does is it modifies the existing restored program to make it more flexible and to make it potentially less partisan and more objective. Representative Reynolds had a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess I'm, I'm not going to comment directly on, um, on the bill, um, except that I'm, I'm wanting to respond to my colleague, Representative Harrington's uh, characterization of um, the systems benefits charge and the energy efficiency programs as subsidies and some sort of giveaways to, you know, weatherization companies. Um, that's not what the systems benefits charge is. That's not what energy efficiency programs are about. Uh, the systems benefits charge and energy efficiency programs like New Hampshire Saves are similar to programs that over half well over half of the states in this country have. They're a recognition that energy efficiency as a resource is uh, different from a supply side resource. Uh, no one can build an, a large energy efficiency plant. Uh, energy efficiency must be procured in very small amounts from individual homes and businesses and government-owned buildings, uh, every place where energy is used, and systems benefits charges and the programs that they support represent uh, limited but strategic uh, collective investment in the resource of energy efficiency. And, uh, you know, there's 30 plus years of, um, you know, scholarship and analysis, uh, again, across the country in which New Hampshire and our state's utilities have participated. Um, everyone wants to make sure that the strategic investments made with the systems benefit charge are cost effective. Uh, and, you know, that's where things like the Granite State test come from. And, um, you know, I agree with the, the comments of my colleague, Representative Munns, when he points out that the back and forth that came from the PUC's order, you know, gutting New Hampshire saves a few years ago resulted in the, in the, the legislature's response in HB 549. Um, and, you know, I don't see the need for the legislature to continue to tinker with, um, with the PUC's operation uh, of, of these programs. Uh, the Granite State test, as we've all said in here, arrived at through much public input, uh, much scholarship and analysis behind it, and um, it works, and we should leave it alone. Further discussion, Representative Vice Chair Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have listened to both sides here. And to be honest, I think there were good arguments made on both sides. What I what I hear and interpret is that if you if you believe that the legislature is infallible and that you have a ironclad system that you never ever want changed because it's perfect and you don't want any outside influence in it, then you would probably not support this amendment. However, if you feel that um, the legislature, and at times that may be correct, sometimes the legislature does want to say to people, this is the way we want it, we want no change, and we want no, no deviation, because that's what we want. But sometimes we may feel that there's something out there where, okay, it's good now, but maybe there's something better out there. Maybe we have people that come on board later on that either find a new way, or maybe parameters change. And maybe the legislature may want to give a little bit of flexibility for a chance to make changes faster than it would be under a legislative process for something that affects ratepayers. I think if you believe that the, in this case, the legislature um, is thinking ahead, that there might be something new in the future, that uh, 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 that there might be some innovative 
uh, processes out there that would be stymied if we didn't pass this amendment, and maybe then you would support this amendment to give that that type of uh, of leeway. I believe in this case I would support this amendment because of I would like to give the I would like to leave the door open for potential innovation in in the future to allow people to adjust on the fly to, to certain issues. And I think this is one case where I think it could help other ratepayers. So that's why I would support this amendment. Thank you. Further discussion? Representative McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd, I'd like to do a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I think based on reading the order, it, it appears that the question comes up for needing a fix from concerns around whether the valuation of the, you know, the cost benefit analysis is, is adequate. And, um, it's a, it's a one now. And the question had been brought up in PUC hearings. Well, what about if it was a two, you know, so that kind of thing, it's like, yes, well, that would be, that would be double <laughs> the cost benefit in terms of the, the raw numbers. But when I talked with triennial planners for the utilities about their perception of how these discussions are going at the Public Utilities Commission. Their perception is not that those kinds of posings are helpful. And what they basically said to me is, uh, if you say, well, 70% of the benefit is going to 20% of the rate payers, that is exactly what energy efficiency programs are designed to do is they're designed to provide money to the people who are eligible and capable of doing energy projects when they can do them in order to provide the state of New Hampshire with a demand side lever that allows us to stop digging the hole of needing more and more uh, outside energy being brought into the state, right? So if we want energy independence and we throw around concepts that we all sort of agree to, on, how do we get there? Energy efficiency is absolutely the best tool. And we have heard, you know, we've heard testimony after testimony from people who really know that this is how you make a dent. And so what we did is we said, here's a program, here are the parameters around the program, this is what we want you to do, we want you to invest like this, we want you to approve or deny a plan based on changes to the plan, and we want the joint utilities and the Department of Energy to work together to make sure, the thing that I read to you earlier, right, that there is evaluation, measurement, and verification studies provided to show that we are delivering rate payer savings. That is already in the law, that is in Section 5, which is subsequent plan and update filings. When you put this in Section 4, just because it relates to cost effectiveness, it contradicts the rest of the law. It also confuses the people who are actually doing the work. So it isn't an advantage by saying you can now bring, you can bring variables into the system that have not been vetted just to say, hey, if you feel like you want something, you'll be able to throw things up in the air. That is, that is not what we've been working towards as a legislature. And so um, I, again, would, I, I see, Chairman, you've got the piece I handed down to you. I just made a couple of copies of that section because I was surprised when I started reading more to realize that we already have a cost effectiveness test. We already have a way of reviewing. And in any one of these proceedings, these things can be broached. If there's a decision that inputs need to change, those discussions can happen in these, in these adjudicative proceedings. There's nothing prohibiting that. I think this opens a dangerous door because it is non-conclusive. It is non-conclusive. It is saying, you know, if you want to throw a wrench in this, you can do that even though we have no idea uh, what your objective is. And I think that that is taking us in the opposite direction of what we did with 549. And I would, I would, I would caution against doing it. Okay, thank you, Representative McGee. I'm gonna suggest that we need to move on pretty quickly here because we have another bill that we wanna discuss and we have to uh, cut this short about 11.20 in order to have uh, caucuses for both our caucuses. So Representative Bernardi, I'll give you the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as I look at this amendment, it's, it's, it's very simple. It basically says that we're gonna continue to use the, the current tests that, uh, that are used to assess cost effectiveness. 
And if an adjudicative process is uh, it uh, moves forward, you can look at other methods as well. It doesn't change the ultimate goal of of addressing whether we're going to um, use the system benefits charge to you know advance those goals at all. It it, it just says we're going to have the opportunity if in an adjudicative process something better or more useful can be teased out we're going to add that to the overall mix i don't see that as a problem i see that as a benefit thank you okay i'm passing out now an amendment to house bill 1623-fn it is amendment number 2024-0734-H, which I'm offering, or I will be offering, on this legislation. And I'm going to wait a minute for the copies to circulate, and then I'm going to go through the changes Close. in the bill. Excuse Close me? And reopen. Close this one and open the next one. Well, this is just a work session, so... We, we move from one to the other seamlessly. We don't need to <laughs> formally open and close them. Okay, so let's go through the changes that are made. And there are quite a few of them, I, I will admit. Changes that were made in, in uh, Amendment 0734H. So the first change is that the word dispatchable has been removed. It seems that dispatchable was a word that offended people, although I don't know why, but um, I took it out because affordable, reliable, and secure ener energy res resources adequately covers, I think, um, what we need to protect here in the state of New Hampshire. So that's a, a change that gets made all over the place. Um, based on the original filed or as, as introduced bill. Lines 2, 5, 8, 14, 22, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that word is now removed from the statute altogether. Next big change is um, on page two of the original bill, lines 16 and 17, that text has been entirely stricken from the amendment. That text no longer uh, appears. The text with... Oh, the, I'm sorry. The text uh, begins with the, the, the um, subparagraph heading of a lowercase g, and it says New Hampshire shall promote the use of clean energy sources, et cetera. So that text no longer appears there. Another major change is also on page two, lines eight and nine. In the amendment, that would be page two, lines four and five. The original text read, <clears throat> excuse me, New Hampshire shall pursue energy conservation and efficiency according to market principles and without state government subsidies. It now reads, New Hampshire shall pursue energy conservation and efficiency according to market principles and, accord and in accordance with cost-effective fiscal strategies as authorized by the legislature, which, one, which once again affirms our... Uh, our reliance on energy efficiency programs that are cost effective. The other major changes that the am amendment makes are in section two of the bill, which starts in the amendment on line 12 of page two. In the original bill, that was line 18 of page two. And this section just adds some clarifying language so, for example, it adds the phrase in-state 
in front of electricity generator to specify that we're talking about generators that are located here in New Hampshire, not somewhere else in the ISO New England regional grid. And the other changes that are made include the addition of the words or decommissioning after retirement and the ad addition of the word involuntary in front of retirement. And then a third big change to this section is the addition of a new paragraph C, which gives the Department of Energy and the Department of Justice the authority to seek funding from the Legislative Fiscal Committee in order to conduct any actions that are described in the two paragraphs or in the paragraph above. And those are the big changes that are made to House Bill 1623 by this amendment, 0734H. And I made those changes in direct response to the public hearing that we had on this bill. I listened to everybody's comments on this bill and made changes that I thought would best satisfy the objections that were made, including those by the Department of Energy. I think I've accommodated all those changes in this amendment. Now, I still think it's important to give the state of New Hampshire the legal tools to protect the health and safety of our citizens by protecting our energy supply. And there are outside forces that could negatively affect our in-state energy supply and we need a tool to be able to protect ourselves and address those issues in court if necessary. So that's the main purpose for filing this bill. For example, the state of Massachusetts has recently adopted official policies to, whenever possible, prevent the adoption of the use of natural gas appliances within the state. If they continue to harm the natural gas marketplace, the, the utilities and the vendors of natural gas may find themselves in a position of being no, no longer financially viable. And if they go under, what happens to the pipelines that bring natural gas to New Hampshire? That's a question that I think we all should contemplate. And it's a question that I think the answer to might give us cause to think that this bill might be useful at some point in the future. So <clears throat> having said that, I'd like to hear the reaction of the rest of the committee. And we'll have further discussions about this uh, this morning and this afternoon. Representative Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what I recalled from the public hearing was there's there was some intimation that this bill would somehow favor fossil fuels. Um, so I, I asked Mr. Roberge if the Department of Energy promoted wind and solar. Answer, yes. The next question was, can you tell me what the cumulative cost of promoting wind and solar has been? And he said he could get that information for me. And he sent a letter, uh, an email, to myself and the rest of the committee. And the, the total cost is $550.5 million since 2008. A couple days later, I, I just happened to be reading uh, Representative uh, Ammon's report on nuclear power. <clears throat> And there was a table in the report from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. And it had uh, a listing of New Hampshire's energy generation mix in 2022, along with ISO New England. So I won't read everything, but, but a couple of things in this table uh, I think are notable. 
one nuclear generated 10,900 gigawatt hours of electricity, which was 58% of New Hampshire's total. Natural gas, 4,500 gigawatts, which was 24% of New Hampshire's total. Wind generated 482 gigawatt hours, which is 3% of New Hampshire's total. Solar generated four gigawatt hours, which I calculated is 0.02%. Uh, that was rounded to zero in the table. For ISO New England, uh, wind generated 4,000 gigawatt hours, 4%, and solar 3,300 gigawatts, which is 3%. And, and the only reason I bring this up is, you know, maybe everyone's already aware of this or maybe not, but, you know, I want to keep things real. You know, where are we really with this? How much money have we spent trying to get more wind and solar onto the grid? And what's been the result? Further discussion. Representative Harrington. Yeah, I have a, a question on the... Um... Section two, loss of in-state electrical generation, when it re uh, refers to um, generated receives notice of an external regulatory action that may result in involuntary retirement or decommissioning. Um, what exactly are we going to define involuntary as? Let me give you an example. Um, uh, the EPA passes a new regulation, Congress passes a new law that says you will limit your uh, emissions to a certain amount. And a gas plant in New Hampshire looks and says, if we have to put that type of equipment on to do that, we are not going to be economically competitive. So we're not being forced to retire. We could go out and buy that equipment and put it on there. But in our opinion, it wouldn't be worth the investment. So we're going to voluntarily retire. So how does that fit in with this involuntary retirement? Because most of these things, it's not the federal government, which I assume who you're referring to in most cases, saying you must shut down that plant, but saying that if you want to keep operating, here's the conditions you have to uh, live up to. That's a good question. So that's the reason I put involuntary into the language of the amendment. Obviously, if it's a voluntary retirement, then... They would never notify the Department of Energy, and the department would never open an investigatory docket. Only if the retirement is involuntary, we'll follow up, or the de decommissioning is involuntary, would the uh, generator n inform the commission of the Department of Energy and request some action. Yes, I guess my up. my question comes down to if. The, a new regulation, federal regulation came out and a generator made a decision saying to spend that kind of money to be in compliance with the new regulation would not be cost effective. So we're not being forced to close, but we choose to close because of economic reasons. Would that be considered involuntary retirement or not? If they didn't have any plans to close before this regulation became uh, or came down from on high somewhere, and if they determine that this regulation could potentially be unconstitutional, then they could turn to the Department of Energy and potentially even further the Department of Justice to seek redress. I just think it's not clear the term involuntary retirement maybe needs to be defined more specifically. Okay, thank you for that comment. <coughs> Representative Kaplan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I have some questions about some of the language around the state's sovereign authority over generation facilities. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but most of these generation facilities are private companies. And so what would, the, what would constitute the state's sovereign authority to make any decision over their operation or, or, their, uh, or their closure, involuntary or not? So the state's sovereignty is guaranteed by the 10th Amendment of the United States Constitution. And the state can exercise that authority when it feels it needs to. That's what the body of this legislation sets up as a framework for the state to do that if it determines that it's necessary. 
Did you need a follow up? Yeah, follow up. So are you suggesting that the, the state could step in and overrule, uh, so to speak, uh, EPA regulations, for example? No, I'm suggesting that the state, for just, for just cause, could challenge an EPA regulation if it, if it thought that said regulation was unconstitutional. So the kind of thing that this legislation is trying to head off is when regulatory agencies create regulations that are not authorized by Congress. And that has happened repeatedly over the last 25 years. The EPA has been challenged in court numerous times. And this legislation gives New Hampshire a way to participate in that if it so desires, based on protecting an in-state generation resource. Follow-up? Yeah, one more follow-up. Uh, that seems to be predicated, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, on, on a Supreme Court decision that hasn't really come down yet. Uh, if you're talking about Chevron deference to regulatory agencies, um, as far as, as, I'm, as I'm aware, those regulatory agencies have the right to make those rules. So No, it's not predicated upon it. And I did discuss it in, in the public hearing when I introduced the bill. The EPA has been taken to court multiple times, uh, and there have been various decisions made about the constitu constitutionality of some of the regulations that they've uh, offered. Some have been overruled. Some have been, have been upheld. The question is, does New Hampshire have any real legal way to object if a rule potentially can hurt an in-state generation facility? Representative Munns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, like Representative Harrington, I had a question on um, page two, uh, section two on page two, but mine mine was a little little, little different. Um, I, I guess I, I my my question is does does external rel regulatory action does that apply to action regulatory actions by state agencies as well? And, and I can think of two examples that could result in the involuntary retirement or decommissioning of a generator's facility. One is the DE, the Department of Environmental Services decides that um, it's in the best interest to eliminate a dam on a river that, and that dam happens to also be a electric, electrical generating facility. Um, if that happens, does that uh, generator have the ability to uh, petition the commissioner and the attorney general to take action? And then another example that, um, you know, we spent quite a bit of time talking about last year is if, for example, the PUC issues an order um, um, kind of um, abrogating an agreement that a power generator such as the Burgess biomass plant has entered into, um, making it unattractive for that business to continue operating. And then the legislature on top of that, you know, introduces some, um, some um, significant uh, financial um, hurdles that they have to cross. If this is passed, does that give does this give the Burgess biomass plant the opportunity to petition the commissioner and the attorney general, or does this apply strictly to federal regulatory um, action? Well, because it, it does discuss in its preamble the Tenth Amendment rights of the state to protect its sovereign sovereign authority, it is aimed more at national rather than in-state activity, regulatory activity. In-state regulatory activity is under the control of the legislature as we set policy for that so that this particular legislation probably would not be invoked in that situation, but it could be, potentially. Representative McGee.
Hello, hello. Testing, testing. Hello. Oh, mine's is mine's on. Hello. Hello, 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 hello. hello? Oh, I guess it's back on. Okay. I don't know what happened there. All right. Well, that now that we've got everyone's attention. Um, so the point I want to make is I want to sort of pull back the gaze again uh, on this one, which this is basically a rewrite of New Hampshire's energy policy, which is uh, 378.37. And it's very much a departure from existing um, language. And so this is more protectionist and from sort of the state's perspective that we have to guard generating assets in order to make sure we don't run out of stuff that we need. But we are part of a regional grid system and we had testimony which was pretty extensive and also succinct from the New Hampshire, New Hampshire um, Power Generators Association and they are responsible for the wholesale markets and they talked about how this could have the unintended consequence of actually take a, taking us in the opposite direction and stifling innovation for, um, for changes that happen because the market puts those pressures out there. And so um, when I look at uh, the language that says that we have a duty to defend the production and supply of affordable, reliable, and secure energy, and then it says, you know, from these particular people, but it says that we have that duty. And I, the first thing I thought when I read the original amendment, I wrote, do we? <laughs> because um, I understand the idea that if we have, uh, if we have Seabrook and it's producing 58% of the generation in the state, electric generation, and most of that energy is being bought by other folks on the regional grid. So we're not necessarily benefiting from all of that energy, but that asset located in our state is an asset that we would seek to protect. But we would have to do that through the existing um, bodies of, uh, you know, regulatory bodies and, and infrastructure that currently exists. We can't vote ourselves into more power than we have, and our DOJ already has the authority to bring a suit anytime something comes against the state that we would think would be against state interest. We don't need to change the state's position on energy policy uh, in order to have that authority. So we're not granting ourselves any additional authority. We're just saying that we want to interpret the Tenth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution as providing us with authority to provide these protections. And the last thing I'll say on this is those protections are in the eye of the beholder because in many cases the changes in policy that are coming down are because many of the powers that be in the federal government are concerned about much larger um, impacts to human health and environmental um, degradation. And that is the whole reason for the efforts that people have been making for the last 30 or 40 years. So it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. And my problem with this bill and this language is that it is not something that we all agree to as far as how energy policy should be described in our state statutes. It's a very much a departure. And, and as well, um, NEPCA had asked us really not to do this basically for the unintended consequences that they could see happening um, to uh, Representative Kaplan's point, to private plants, which are going through, going through their own um, changes based on the need for cleaner power. So what, what they said in their testimony was this could have the unintended consequence of alleviating people from making those changes at a time when it would be really helpful if they would be doing that. So um, I think it puts, it puts a finger on the scale of how we approach energy policy that is, as I said, very much a departure from where the state has been for the last 30 years. And so I can't vote for it because I don't think it 
I don't think it serves us. And I also don't think it, um, I don't think it comes from a place where it understands both how the system works and, um, and how the regulatory piece works, right? It, it, it seems to be devoid of understanding that we're part of a regional grid. So we just really don't have, this doesn't give us any more authority is I guess what I'm trying to say. The bill doesn't really help us do anything. Um, so I, I can't see muddying the waters, which we've now used to describe every single <laughs> bill that we've reviewed this morning. But I just don't see muddying the waters of state energy policy uh, with something like this that says we're going to have to get out and legally defend uh, the life of, of power plants, which are morphing and transitioning and changing based on the free market. I, I just I don't think that's the right thing for us to be doing. Seems like, oh, here we go. Okay. Well, mine's working. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me. And um, <clears throat> yeah, my comments will be, I guess, unsurprisingly, along the lines of my ranking member's comments. I, too, went and, you know, of course, looked at the existing uh, statute, and I found, you know, the, the New Hampshire Energy Policy existing law, section, um, the site right here. 378.37 to be, you know, a, a rather elegant 73-word, uh, total of 73 words, uh, general statement that mentions things we all support, or agree on as, as policy goals, lowest reasonable cost, reliability, diversity of energy resources, uh, cost-effective energy efficiency, and other demand-side resources are in there, uh, along with, of course, uh, safety and health. So, you know, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't um, have no doubt about your, your sincerity, obviously, and concern, you know, for, for New Hampshire's energy security and the welfare of the citizens of New Hampshire. I just um, have uh, a real concern, as, as Representative McGee expressed, with this sort of, um, you know, uh, alternative statement of what that consists of, how to achieve energy security for, for the state of New Hampshire, and uh, particularly to, um, you know, and I appreciate your work on the amendment. Um, you're, you're hearing uh, or you're listening at the public hearing and responding to the concerns like elimination of the word dispatchable and, and some of the other changes you made. I do appreciate that. But my, my remaining concerns really are still with the continued inclusion of uh, inclusion of one concept and the exclusion of another concept, which, you know, the word diversity of energy resources, you have, you are, t you would be taking out of New Hampshire's energy policy. Um, and you specifically uh, include in particular, you know, paragraph 1A of your um, amendment continues to state that the, the, the state of New Hampshire shall work to ensure the state's energy independence. Um, I just think, you know, law, New Hampshire law has no business including a statement like that because may, while the notion of energy independence may be appealing, uh, it is totally, it is totally fallacious. New Hampshire, and really every state in New England, is the farthest thing from energy independent that a state could be. <laughs> um, while we may have a um, um, nuclear power plant located within our boundaries, uh, it's a plant that serves the region, not simply New Hampshire. And New Hampshire has no authority or means to uh, one day, you know, somehow order that plant to only serve the state of New Hampshire. So, you know, Seabrook is a big generating asset and it may be within our borders, but it serves the region in, of which we are a part. Um, you know, and, and a vast majority of the energy we uh, use besides uh, coming from Seabrook is from fossil fuels. 
And of course, New Hampshire or, and New England has none of those. All of those are imported to this region, as you mentioned, via pipelines. And we remain um, highly dependent on, or I should say, you know, extremely vulnerable to disruptions in, in those uh, weather events, acts of war, you know, the price of gas, natural gas spikes, and the state experiences what we, what we did uh, the, the, a couple of years ago in, in uh, price spikes for our electricity. So, you know, if, if we're going to pass a new law or make a new statement about um, energy security for the state of New Hampshire, you know, it's, I don't think it's going to be found uh, either in that, you know, fallacious notion of energy independence or in sort of uh, asserting a new sort of state power over private market uh, generation assets that we somehow might be able to command to continue uh, operating or something, you know, rather the state's energy policy should uh, embrace uh, not, in, not independence, but interdependence, the interdependence that we have with our um, New England neighbors, as well as our, our neighbor uh, north in Canada as well as embracing, going back to the other word that I mentioned, the diversity uh, of energy resources that power our economy today and liberate us from over-dependence on any one asset or technology. So those are my thoughts. Hello. Oh, mine's working. <laughs> Hello. Oh, now it's working. Okay. All right. So we have three minutes left. Representative Bernardi, you get the last word. Well, mine's still working. <laughs> There's some crackling.
Hey everybody, I have a working mic. Cross your fingers that it stays that way for a while. We're here for an executive session on three bills this afternoon. We're going to be looking at House Bill 1036 relative to assessment of cost effectiveness of the system benefits charge, House Bill 1600 relative to participation in net energy metering, and House Bill 1623 relative to the state energy policy. We had an extensive full committee work session on all three bills this morning. We think we have a pretty good idea of, about how things are going to go this afternoon. And one little wrinkle that happened that I wasn't made aware of until about two minutes ago is that Representative Lucius Parshall, who wasn't here this morning, is also not going to be here this afternoon, apparently. Lucius is sick. We wish him uh, a speedy recovery and hope he gets well very, very soon so we can see him uh, sooner rather than later. And the House rule is that you can't replace a member unless you notify the relevant staff 24 hours in advance. But I have asked Representative McGee to go and see if she can because these are extraordinary circumstances. Representative Partial didn't know he was going to be sick until he woke up this morning. So I've asked if we can get a replacement on short notice. Um, the speaker's office? She's calling the staff and speaker, I guess. I don't know who she's calling, but yeah. she's she's working on it. You, you probably should alert the speaker, too, because he might not be kind. I'm sure the speaker will get involved, yes. I'm sure the speaker will get involved. I believe, Mrs. Chairman, that's a House rule, yeah. right? Representative Harrington. I believe that's a House rule, and we can't waive House rules, can we? I am i can't, but maybe the speaker can. That's why I asked her to double check. So we will proceed one way or the other with, this ex with the executive session. I'd prefer that we had... Uh, both caucuses at full strength, but we'll see what happens. Representative Cloger. <laughs> thank you, Chair. I'd just like to thank the Chair for reaching out to the minority leadership. I almost did not make it in today, um, last night, probably for a similar reason, it sounds. Um, I cleared up. Nothing contagious. It's just one of those things I was going to call you at 2 in the morning. <laughs> thank you. Much as I like you, Tom, please don't call me at 2 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the reason. All right. So there's one other matter I want to discuss with you all before we start our first executive session, and that is at the beginning of the, of the day today, I mentioned that I had visited the clerk to talk about the germaneness of an amendment to House Bill 4 1644, which we passed 20 to nothing last Tuesday. And the clerk informed me during the lunch break that he and the speaker had determined that that amendment is not germane. Therefore, the bill can't go forward as written or as submitted. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a motion on the House floor. Well, first, uh, Representative McGee is going to pull the bill off consent because that's where it currently resides. And then... I'm going to make a motion on the House floor to refer the bill for interim study. And I would encourage you all to support that motion. 1644. It's on the consent calendar. It was a 20 to nothing vote, but we will refer it now for interim study. And before I start this next executive session, I'm going to ask Representative McGee if she had any luck. No, Mr. Chairman, I did not. Okay, well. Okay, so <clears throat> since uh, Representative McGee was not able to get any relief from the Speaker's office, 
I just had a conference with Representative Nodder, and she has some other business to transact, so she is going to leave so that we'll have an equal equal caucus uh, representation. Okay, so Representative Nodder, you're excused, and we thank you for making that offer. So with that, I'm going to open an executive session on House Bill 1600 FN, and I'm going to recognize Representative Corman for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for House Bill 1600 FN, I move ought to pass with amendment with Amendment 2024-0764H, which I distributed to everybody beforehand. Okay, so Representative Corman moves the adoption of Amendment 0764H, and I second that motion. So it has been moved and seconded that we adopt this amendment, and I'll, the chair will recognize Representative Corman to discuss. Thank you. Uh, as we talked about during the work session, this amendment uh, has basically the same idea in the first part as the original bill, where a municipal host that is using its power to offset the load of a municipal or county aggregation, uh, then it is not going to be considered part of default service, not in the load requirements of, of the ISO New England, and therefore um, what we should be seeing would be uh, less requirement in the transmission lines and therefore saving money for everybody with lower transmission requirements. And then part two of the amendment is really just housekeeping that says that um, the part of RSA 53E4 that refers to customer data, it's referring to the correct RSA in that. Okay, thank you very much. I forgot to mention earlier that we have a visitor, a substitute today, that's Charlie Melvin, um, sitting in for James Summers. So thank you, Charlie, for being here. All right, further discussion on this legislation. Seeing none, I'll point out that we are gonna vote both for the amendment and then for the motion of ought to pass. So I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion of ought to pass on the amendment 0764H. Vice Chair Thomas. Yes. Not is here. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Lecky. Yes. Representative uh, Brezhny. Yes. Representative Bernardi. Yes. Representative Plogé. Yes. Representative Melvin. Yes. Representative Kennedy. Yes. Representative McGee. Yes. Representative McWilliams. Yes. Representative Cretion. Yes. Representative Kaplan. Yes. Representative Munns. Yes. Representative Noel. Yes. Representative Thomas. Yes. Representative Corman. Yes. Representative Reynolds. Yes. Chairman Vose. Yes. 18-0. By a vote of 18 to 0, the committee adopted uh, the committee amendment 2024-0. 764H is adopted. I now recognize Representative Corman for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move ought to pass for 16, HB 1600 FN, ought to pass as amended with Amendment 0764H. And I second that motion. So it's been moved and seconded that we adopt HB 1600 FN as amended by 2024-0764-H. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, when he's ready, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion of ought to pass as amended on HB 1600. Vice Chair Thomas. Yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Lewicki. Yes. Representative Brezhny. Yes. Representative Bernardi, yes. Representative Plogé. Yes. Representative Melvin. Yes. Representative Kennedy. Yes. Representative McGee. Yes. 
Representative McWilliams. Yes. Representative Creation. Yes. Representative Kaplan. Yes. Representative Munns. Yes. Representative Noel. Yes. Representative Thomas. Yes. Representative Corman. Yes. Representative Reynolds. Yes. Chairman Vos. Yes. 18-0. Okay, by a vote of 18 to 0, the committee adopts the motion of ought to pass as amended for House Bill 1600 as amended by 2024-0764-H. Without objection, we'll put this on the consent calendar. Hearing no objections, on consent it will go. I thank you. And Representative Corman will write the committee report. And I need that before you leave uh, the building this afternoon. Thank you. I need to correct the tense. It's already written. Okay. <laughs> All right. So with that, we'll close the exec session on House Bill 1600. And now we'll open an exec session on House Bill 1036. And if I can find my paperwork. Chair recognizes Representative Harrington for a motion. I move adoption of amendment 2024-0295-H to HB 1036. Yeah, I think what you meant was 2024-0763-H. That is correct. 0763-H. Okay, great. I second that motion. And I recognize Representative Harrington to discuss the amendment. Well, I recognize we discussed this for a long time this morning. I don't think anyone's going to change their mind, so there's really not much point in discussing it further. Further discussion? Representative McGee. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I would just say that I think among my caucus, we thought that the amendment was preferable to the original bill. So we're still, we're voting for the amendment, whether we like it or not, and then the bill as amended, right? So we have two two votes, correct? Correct. We will vote on the amendment first. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of the adoption of the amendment. 0763H for House Bill 1036. Vice Chair Thomas. Yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Wilecki. Yes. Representative Brezhny. Yes. Representative Bernardi. Yes. Representative Plage. Yes. Representative Melvin. Yes. Representative Kennedy. Yes. Representative McGee. Yes. Representative McWilliams. Yes. Representative Creation. Yes. Representative Kaplan. No. Representative Munns. Yes. Representative Noel. Yes. Representative Thomas. Yes. Representative Corman. Yes. Representative Reynolds. Yes. Chairman Vos. Yes. 17-1. By a vote of 17-1, the amendment 0763H is adopted. That brings us to the question of ought to pass as amended. The chair recognizes Representative Harrington. I move to um, pass amendment, uh, let me get this right now, 2024-0763 on to amendment, I'm sorry, on to HB 1036. So as amended, ought to pass. So you move ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1036, correct? Okay, I second that motion. And I will reiter reiterate some of what I said this morning, namely that this bill does not obligate the Public Utilities Commission to make any changes to the existing cost effectiveness formulas that are used to determine if energy efficiency programs are cost effective. It does not mandate any changes. But what it does do 
is it gives the commission flexibility that if something better comes down the pike in the next two or three years, that they can look at it and consider whether there is an, a better way to evaluate energy efficiency costs effectiveness. That's all this legislation does. I think it's the kind of public policy that we ought to be providing as guidance to our regulatory agencies. And I think we should adopt House Bill 1036 as amended. Further discussion? Representative Kaplan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I agree that the uh, amended version is, is a better version, uh, but I still can't vote for this bill as amended uh, because I think uh, that the flexibility already exists in statute, and this would be opening up a can of worms that's already been adjudicated and uh, is not in the best interest of my constituents, so I can't, be, I can't vote for it. Further discussion? Well, seeing none, I guess I'll ask the clerk. We did talk about it extensively this morning, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1036. Vice Chair Thomas. Yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Wicke. Yes. Representative Brezhny. Yes. Representative Bernardi. Yes. Representative Plogier. Yes. Representative Melvin. Yes. Representative Kennedy. Yes. Representative McGee. No. Representative McWilliams. No. Representative Cretion. No. Representative Kaplan. No. Representative Munns. No. Representative Noel. No. Representative Thomas. No. Representative Corman. No. Representative Reynolds. No. Chairman Bowes. Yes. 99. By a vote of nine to nine, the motion of ought to pass as amended fails. So the bill will go to the House floor without recommendation. Who will write the, uh, a representative Harrington, I should say, will write the uh, report for ought to pass. Who will write the motion for, or the report for ITL? I will, Mr. Chair. Representative McGee will write the report for ITL. Okay, <clears throat> I would like that before you leave today, if possible. If you can't uh, do it today, then let me know why. Ditto Representative Harrington. Okay. I can let you know why right now. Like, for some reason, my email won't work here. So I can't send it to you. I'll send it to you when I get home. Okay. All right. So with that, we'll close the exec session on House Bill 1036. And I'll open an exec session on House Bill 1623 relative to state energy policy. And I am passing out a new amendment that was crafted during the lunch break. This is amendment number 2024-0782H. And this amendment, while it's working its way around to you, I will explain what it does. If you go to page two and look at line four, the previous amendment stated, see if I can find it. The previous amendment on that line read, that may result in the involuntary retirement or decommissioning of the generator's facility. The amendment changes that to read, that makes continued operation economically infeasible 
or may result in the involuntary retirement or decommissioning of the generator's facility. So it basically adds the phrase, makes continued operation economically infeasible or. It's it line, adds that text. It's line 14, not four. Oh, I'm sorry. Line 14. If I said four, I misspoke. My apologies. Yeah, it's line 14. That's where this uh, change gets made. And that is the only change to uh, that this amendment makes. And um, we discussed it extensively this morning. So I'd like to hear any further amendment or further discussion on this amendment before we take a vote on it. Oh, we didn't make any motions. Okay. I'm sorry. I move the adoption of amendment 2024-0782H and the chair recognizes Vice Chair Thomas. Second. Moved and seconded that we adopt the amendment. Now we can have a discussion. Representative McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just like to reiterate my, my perspective that the, the amendment as well as the original amendment <laughs> are unworkable because they attempt to redefine how the electric system works um, and how it is regulated by um, stating that that the state has an interest in private businesses. And I think that goes against our general position that we are for free markets. And we understand that these generating facilities are not under our jurisdiction. And we understand what the system is that does have jurisdiction and how we would have to interact with them if we were trying to save a particular generating facility. So I just, I just still don't think this, this is workable language. Thanks. Vice Chair Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think this amendment clarifies an issue uh, that some representatives had earlier and adds to the existing bill. So I think in any event, this amendment does make the bill better and I will be supporting it. Further discussion? Representative Munns. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I too have some continued concerns with the language in the bill. Um, the, the change in this amendment, uh, while it certainly addresses um, one of the issues that I think I had raised with respect to the, um, the Burgess biomass plant, um, I'm still not clear what an external regulatory action is and whether that applies to um, state or, or federal authorities. And um, I, um, I continue to struggle with the numerous cases where the word sovereign and sovereign authority is included in the um, in the um, in the bill, and um, not not sure that that's necessary, and concerned as to why it's in there. So I will will not be able to support this amendment. Thank you. Further discussion. Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think this bill confirms that. In the end, the state is the ultimate sovereign authority on the need to uh, and the uh, having the uh, the responsibility to ensure there is power available within the state. After all other regulatory avenues have been pursued, at the end of the day, the state is the ultimate sovereign. Further discussion, Re Representative Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I I. I appreciate, uh, I think that the most recent amendment is a is a, a slight improvement to the prior amendment, but I, um, you know, I have to, have to push back on um, my colleague, Representative Bernardi's assertion that this bill could possibly make the state of New Hampshire the ultimate um, authority. We, the state of New Hampshire in no way has the uh, information, the analytical capability, uh, let alone the um, legal authority to do what ISO New England and the North American 
uh, Electric Reliability Corporation are in fact legally charged with doing by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which is having the responsibility to continuously monitor and manage the regional electric grid and ensure reliability for everyone on it, all six New England states. So I just, this idea that New Hampshire in the end would uh, have either the, the knowledge or the authority to, to do what this bill envisions uh, is, is just, uh, I think, not there. And uh, in addition, uh, just briefly restate what I, something I said earlier, I don't think that language that uh, asserts that the state of New Hampshire could ever be, uh, is or could ever be energy independent uh, has any place in New Hampshire law. We are very far from energy independent and uh, Secured, you know, the state of Texas, as large as that is, uh, that years ago asserted their desire to be energy independent and to actually be their own uh, electric grid. They finally learned that even even they could not be uh, security was not found in being energy independent in in the huge cold snap that they experienced a couple of years ago when their their grid went down. Gas plants failed, uh, transmission lines failed. Uh, certainly the state of New Hampshire will never be energy independent and we shouldn't uh, state it as a policy goal that, that we're going to be. Instead, we should embrace uh, our interdependence and the other word, diversity of energy resources. So can't support this bill. Further discussion? Representative Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a question, I guess, for you on the amendment. Um, on page two, line 20, it, it says that um, they, the Department of Energy is, is mandated to recommend any action necessary to defend the generator. However, there's no, there's no inclusion of public benefit or community impact, even though through at the, the top of the page on page one, you talk about health, safety, and welfare, health, safety, and welfare. You, it's mentioned a few times. So why is not the health, safety, and welfare considered under this mandate, I guess? That's my question. Well, because this paragraph pertains to the involuntary retirement or decommissioning of a generator plant. Right, but but what you're saying is that if a plant has has an involuntary retirement or decommissioning that the Department of Education, oh, Department of Energy, sorry, is recommending must recommend any action necessary to defend the generator. But shouldn't those actions also consider public benefit and community impact? Well, that recommendation would be based on the results of the investigatory docket to determine how such an involuntary retirement or decommissioning would affect the reliability and affordability of the state's energy resources. Okay, I think we're ships passing in the night, but thank you, thank you. Further discussion? Representative Kaplan. Yes, this is, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is uh, sort of along the lines of Representative Wendy Thomas's uh, concerns. I, I just wonder how um, the state is going to step in on behalf of private generators when it's determined that re external regulatory action makes their operation economically unfeasible. Uh, I, I just, I mean, I understand the chair's sort of ideological position that the regulatory agencies at the federal level ought to be backed up by uh, a, a legislative mandate, but I just fear that th this is going to put us at odds with federal regulations and is based on a, you know, a flawed view of, of our sovereignty and how that, you know, how that means that, that it's, it's, you know, the federal regulations still have supremacy and, and we need to 
not be writing something that goes contrary to that in our in our official policy on energy. So I can't vote for this bill. Even additional if discussion. Vice Chair Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just like to reiterate that whether it, it's one argument whether or not uh, the state can actually uh, uh, or has the ability to uh, physically perform some of these actions. I think the point and I'd like to refer back to what Representative Bernardi said is that this is just a reaffirmation of the state's right under the Tenth Amendment, which, uh, far as I can recollect, back in you know in the 1700s. Uh, there was no mention of electric grid in the Constitution. So all powers not expressly prohibited in the Constitution fall back on the state. So I think this is just a reaffirmation that the state has the right, not saying it has the ability or capability or even the materials to carry forward, but they at least have the right to challenge and to um, do certain laws as to uh, for the to protect the will for the of, of its people here, which would be the, the uh, power grid. So, although this bill may not have a lot of teeth to it, I think the point is that it's saying the state does reserve its right to challenge these regulations under the Tenth Amendment. Representative Munns. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With with all due respect to to Representative Doug Thomas. Um, that's not all this bill does. This bill eliminates or changes dramatically the state's energy policy. And if the intent was to um, introduce legislation to reassert the state's 10th Amendment rights, doing that and, and eliminating the state's energy policy would not be the appropriate way to do that. Further discussion? Seeing none, uh, Representative McGee. It did just come to me. So uh, on that point of this affecting the state, the stated state energy policy, um, we have multiple vehicles that are rewriting the state energy policy this time around on both sides of the wall. So um, I, I, another reason that I wouldn't vote for this particular legislation is that this is the one that is counter to the other, um, the other two vehicles that have been passed, which are more in keeping with the existing policy. And I think if we are going to undertake uh, an about face on what we are listing as New Hampshire's priorities in terms of energy policy, this should be a more fulsome process than what we've had here today. Um, because this doesn't reflect what it, it was mentioned earlier uh, in the work session. Uh, I believe 72 words or something. I think Ned wrote, read it. It's, it's succinct, it's elegant, um, and it was pulled together over time to really encompass all of the things that we're trying to accomplish with our energy policy. And I think that the language in this bill would replace that language and it would, um, it would leave us wanting on a number of areas that were mentioned in that original policy, which are preserved in both the House bill and the Senate bill that um, seek to modify that energy policy with the, um, the IRP, right? The, um, the integrated resource planning uh, language that we're trying to reinstate that we took out of the statutes last year with 281. So the state's consumer advocate wrote in a recent article Right now, and I quote, right now, RSA 378-37 is a melange of mixed messages. There are references to keeping utilities financially healthy, to protecting the safety and health of our citizens, to maximizing, maximizing the use of cost-effective energy efficiency, and etc. <clears throat> so... If there is a melange of contradictory messages there, then maybe we should replace it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd just like to say that I read the article, and he he also goes on to say that he does not support 1623. Further discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of the adoption of Amendment 2024-0782H. 
Vice Chair Thomas. Yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Lewicki. Yes. Representative Brezhny. Yes. Representative Bernardi. Yes. Representative Ploget. Yes. Representative Melvin. Yes. Representative Kennedy. Yes. Representative McGee. No. Representative McWilliams. No. Representative Creation. No. Representative Kaplan. No. Representative Munns. No. Representative Well. No. Representative Thomas. No. Representative Corman. No. Representative Reynolds. No. Chairman Vos. Yes. Nine to nine. Nine to nine. So by a vote of nine to nine, the motion to adopt Amendment 0782H fails. And so does the bill. So it will go to the House floor without recommendation. I will write the report for the motion of ought to pass as amended. And Representative McGee, who will write the report for? Uh, Representative Kaplan. Representative Kaplan will write the report for? ITL and Representative Kaplan, get that to me as quickly as you can, preferably before you leave here today. Okay, with that, we are done. I'm gonna close the executive session on House Bill 1623. Is there any other business that needs to come before the committee before we call it a day? I did not. I did not. So, Representative McGee wants to pull HB 1644 off the consent calendar, but you need 10 people to support that motion. Can we get 10 people here who will support that motion? Yes. So, I will send a note to the clerk and I'll CC everyone on STE, and then whoever wants to just send their name into him, you'll be on the list and he'll take he'll take the first 10. So, thank you. Okay. Anything else? Representative McWilliams. Do we have any future meetings scheduled? Anything upcoming for work for the committee? No, there are no future meetings scheduled, and we will not plan to meet again until March 15th when we go to ISO New England. Representative Bernardi. So we, we have nothing scheduled, but we have a request for DOE and DES to uh, provide us a um, discussion about issues that you guys are sending me. Uh, and I ask that they select days in March and get back when they can do that. So it's possible that the first Tuesday in March could be one of those days. I don't know. Right now, the only firm date we have a meeting is the ISO New England trip on the 15th of March. Okay, everybody clear on that? We are adjourned. See you on Thursday.